What's going on, everybody? Um, coming on this morning, um, just felt the need this morning to read, man. We got a lot going on, man. And so, uh, what's up, everybody on Instagram? I'm about to read a letter to Birmingham Jail live. Many What's people, going on, everybody? Oh, I should probably mute myself here. Many people have um, never read it. And so this morning, I'm going to take the time uh, to read it. Um, so we're going to read Letter from a Birmingham Jail, which was written by Dr. King uh, in 1963. April 16th. Um, I'm going to begin reading in two minutes. Um, if you don't want to watch it on Instagram, I'm actually live on YouTube and Facebook um, through our Reach Church page or my personal page. Um, if you want to look at it um, on Facebook or, or YouTube. Um, so I'm going to start reading in about two minutes. Hey, what's going on, Samachi? We're gonna be reading again, Dr. King's uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, what did I, I think I labeled this wrong? I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah, I did, I labeled that wrong. I put, <laughs> I labeled it a letter too. It's a letter from, um, but y'all got it, y'all know what I mean. All right, so I'm gonna begin reading. This is a letter from a Birmingham jail in April, uh, written in April 16, 1963 uh, by Dr. King. Um, and this is a letter from Dr. King to um, fellow clergymen, churches. Um, and there's so much in this letter. A lot of times, man, we are blind to, in the Bible, you always see the importance, especially in the Old Testament of, you know, when they had a victory or they passed through a land, they stacked these stones and the Bible would say so that when the children would ask, they would be able to tell them the stories and too often, man, we do not know our history. And so we think things are new. We think nobody's ever felt like this. We felt like, we feel like this is a new place in history. Um, and the reality is, man, where we are is just a repeated cycle of time um, or, or dare I say, evidence that we have not made the forward progress that we have been manipulated and suggested to have made in 1963. Listen to the similarities as Dr. King writes to his fellow clergymen. Uh, While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statements calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statements in what I hope to be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I'm here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the views which argue against outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every Southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliation, affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff, educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on the call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program in such were deemed, if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented and when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I along with several members of my staff am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because in injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the eighth century BC left their villages and carried their their thus says the Lord's far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus um, and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ, oh my bad, 
My bad. And carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world. So I am here compelled to carry the gospel of freedom far beyond my hometown. Like Paul, I must con constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am uh, cognizant of the uh, inter uh, interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow uh, uh, outsider agitated idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express the similar concern for the conditions that brought forth the demonstration. Sound similar? I'm sure that none of you will want to rest content with the superficial kind of social uh, ana uh, analyst that, uh, uh, that deals merely with efforts and does not grapple with underlining causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place with under... I'm sorry, it is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of facts to determine whether injustice exists, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no uh, gainsaying the, uh, the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced gross injustment treatments in the court, gross unjust treatments in the courts. There has been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. Destruction of property, y'all. There are the hard, brutal facts of the case on the base of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city's fathers, but the, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiations. Then last September came the opportunity to talk with leaders of Birmingham's economic community. In the course of the negotiations, uh, negotiations certain promises were made by the merchants. For example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs on the basis of these promises. The Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Mo Movement for Human Rights agreed uh, uh, on that all uh, to do this for all demonstrations. As the weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. A few signs briefly removed, returned, the others remained. As in so many past experiences, our hopes have been blasted and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We have no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and the national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops of non-violence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliation? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? What we decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Attack the economics, y'all. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. Then it occurred to us that Birmingham's uh, uh, mayoral election was coming up in March and we speedily decided to postpone action until after election day. When we discovered that the commissioner of police safe, safety, Eugene Bull Connor had piled up enough votes to be in the runoff, we decided again to postpone action until the day after the runoff so that the demonstrations could not be used to cloud the issue. Like many others, we waited to see Mr. Connor defeated, and to this end, we endured postponement after postponement. Having aided in this community need, we felt that our direct action program could be delayed no longer. You may, all, you may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis 
and foster such a tension that a community which has con constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to so dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of my citing the creation of tension as part of the works of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessarily for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half truths to be unfeathered to the unfeathered realm of creative uh, analysis, 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 <laughs> and objective appraisal. So must we see the need for nonviolent. Um, gratifies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. You ever highlight stuff and, and then the, highlight, the highlighted stuff gets in the way of you actually seeing the word, especially when you highlight in blue. Anyway, the purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation uh, so crisis packed that it would inevitably open the door to negotiations. I therefore concur with you to call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southern land been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in monologue rather than in dialogue. One of the basic points in your statements is that the action that I, that I and my associates have taken in Birmingham is untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this query is that the new Birmingham administration must be probed uh, 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 about as much as the out outgoing one before it will act. We are sadly mistaken. If we feel that the election of Albert Boutwell as mayor will bring the millennium to Birmingham, while Mr. Boutwell is as much more gentle than Mr. Connor, they are both segreg uh, segregationists dedicated to maintenance of the status quo. I have hoped that Mr. Boutwell will be reasonable enough to see the futility uh, of massive resistance to desegregation. But he will not see this without pressure from devotees of civil rights. My friends, I must say that to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. Let me repeat that again. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressures. This is why I'm calling for lawyers. Um, lamentable, it is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privilege voluntarily. It is a historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privilege voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as uh, Reinhold uh, Nibor, I'm butchering his name, um, has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in view of those who have not suffered unduly for the decease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word, wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for a constitution, uh, for a constitutional and God-given right. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed towards gaining political independence, but we still creep at a horse and buggy pace towards gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait, but when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mother and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at will, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you have seen the vast majority of 20 million Negro brothers smothered, smothering in the airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when you see it told 
that fun town is closed to colored children, uh, uh, children and see clouds of inferiority beginning to form in the little mental sky and see her back beginning to distort her pass her personality to develop an unconscious bitterness towards white people when you have a concord and answer for a five-year-old son who is asking daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross country drive to find it necessary to sleep night after night in an uncomfortable corner of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated in, day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When you when your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never giving the respectable title missus, when you are uh, are haired on day and, and, and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stands, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you go forever fighting a, 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 a degenerate, uh, a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You scare me. We hear this often, wait, wait, if you don't understand, you cannot tell us why are we acting this way. You cannot tell us why are we press. We cannot tell us you if you do not if you have not experienced this. You don't get the privilege of telling us. Wait. Let me keep reading. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. There is certainly a, a legitimate concern. Since we, these are Dr. King's words, y'all. We love to quote Dr. King. So let's actually read Dr. King's words. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in the public schools at first glance. It may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has, one has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, there's the difference between the two. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A law is a man-made code that, that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with moral law. To put it in terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, uh, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human uh, personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statuses are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation is used, uh, segregation to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, uh, yeah, Buber substitutes a ayat relationship for the I thou relationship and ends up regulating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only political, economical, economically and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and awful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is segregation. Is not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. Thus, that I can urge man to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right, and I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances, for they are morally wrong. Remember, these are Dr. King's words. Let us consider, he says, we all have an obligation to obey just laws, but disobey unjust laws. He says, let us consider a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code um, or power uh, that a majority group compels a minority group to obey, but does not make binding on itself. This is a, 
uh, this is difference made legal. By the same token, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Let me give another explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that as a result of being denied the right to vote had no part in enacting or devising the law. Who can say that the legislator of Alabama would set up the state segregation laws was democratically elected. Throughout Alabama, all sorts of devious methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some countries in which, even though Negroes constitute a majority of the population, not a single Negro is registered. Can any law enacted under such circumstances be considered democratically structured? Sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I have been arrested on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, there is nothing wrong in having an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but such an ordinance becomes unjust when it is used to maintain segregation and to deny citizenship, the first citizens, the first amendment privilege of peacefully assembling and protest. In other words, there's nothing wrong with requiring me to have a permit to protest, but when you place things in place that make it impossible for me to get that permit, now that law is unjust. And Dr. King says, I must break it in protest anyway. I hope you are able to see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as would the um, uh, uh, rabid uh, segregationists. I would lead, that would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with the willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law um, that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was, it was evidence uh, 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 in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced uh, su uh, superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions um, um, and the pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is the reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. White people <laughs> broke laws and burned and looted for what they wanted. We never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything that Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at that time, I, I would have aided and confronted my, and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen counselor of the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who's, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. I say this all the time. We want to uphold this false sense of peace. But that is no real peace if there is no justice. You cannot have peace without justice. Who constantly says, I agree with you and your goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. Who believes he can set the timetable on another man's freedom who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outward 
outright rejection. I have hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exists for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I have hoped that white moderates would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase of the transition from an agnostic ne negative piece in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantial to a, to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity, dignity and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with like a boil. It can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be open with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of natural opinion before it can be cured. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But this is a, but is this a logical assertion? It's like condemning a robbed man because he possesses money and it precipitates the evil act of robbery. Here's what he's saying. For those who says, how can you protest knowing that they may turn out violent and people will come there? Well, well saying that we shouldn't protest because it, it, it gives the, it, it creates a scene for violence. It's like telling the robbed man that it's his fault that he was robbed because he carried money. Isn't this like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical inquiries precipi uh, precipitated the act of his misguided uh, populace in which they made him drink hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing de devotion to God's will precipitated the act of evil crucifixion? We must come to see that as the federal courts have consistently affirmed, it is wrong to urge an individual to cease his efforts to gain his basic constitutional right because the quest may precipitate, precipitate violence. Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. I hope that made sense. I had also hoped that the white moderate would reject the myth concerning time in relation to the struggle for freedom. I have just received a letter from a white brother in Texas. He writes, all Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, eventually. But it is, but it is possible that you are in too great a religious hurry. It has taken Christianity almost 2000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. Such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time, from the strangely rational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will eventually cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. More and more, I feel that people of ill will have used time much more effectively than have the people of goodwill. We, have, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless effortless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creati creatively and the knowledge that the time is always right to do right. Mm, I gotta Y'all heard it. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy and transform our pending national, uh, 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 I don't even know that word, elegy, elegy, into a creative psalm of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our national policies from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of human dignity. You speak of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. And at first, I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent efforts as those of extremists. I think about Kaepernick, 
right? The need by white evangelicals was said to be an extremist. We were called thugs for taking a knee during a national anthem. He says, I began thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. And here's where I struggle. One is the force of complacency, made up in part by Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, are so drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness that they have adjusted to segregation. And in part, uh, a few middle-class Negroes who, because of a degree of academic and economic uh, security, and because in some ways they profit by segregation, have become insensitive to the problem of the masses. My God, this is my aggravation today. We stand in the gaps of those who are a part of a community and they may not have, have felt the, the, the racial tensions that those of us have felt on the other side of the line. And so they side with their oppressors and, and, and tear down the, the oppressed brothers and sisters who try to stand against this. You got black, white, you got black Negroes fighting against each other because they don't have the same story. And so they stand with their oppressor and destroy the oppressed who look like them. Dr. King says, I stand in the middle of the two. But then he says this, the other force is one of bitterness and hatred, and it comes prayers, uh, perilously close to advocating violence. He said it is expressed in the various black national nationalist groups that are springing up across the nation, the largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement nourished by the Negro's frustration over, over the continued existence of racial discrimination. Today, I would say as the Hebrew Israelites, this movement is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely uh, 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 despised Christianity, and who have concluded that the white man is an evil devil. I have tried to stand between these two forces, saying that we need uh, 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 to emulate neither the do nothingness or the complacent nor the hatred and despair of the black nationalists, right? For there is the more excellent way of love and nonviolent protest. I am grateful to God that though through the influence of the Negro church, the way of nonviolence becomes an integral part of our struggle. In this philosophy, if this philosophy had not emerged by now, many streets of the South would, I am convinced, be flowing with blood. And I am further convinced that in our white brothers, hmm? you good? Oh, you want to do some reading? Oh, oh okay. If this philosophy had not emerged by now, many streets of the South would, I am convinced, be flowing with blood. And I am further convinced that if our white brothers dismiss as rabble rousers, and outside agitators, those of us who employ nonviolent direct action, and if they refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, millions of Negroes will, out of frustration and despair, seek solace and security in Black nationalist ideologies. Listen, church, listen, church, listen, church. Because the church is so divided, because the church cannot agree that racism is wrong, because the church cannot repent of its white nationalist, its white supremacy running rapid through Christianity. Listen, I am on the other side of this story where I am in a community where people despise Christianity and they turn to black nationalist groups who are going to get things done by violence or hatred, because the church will not just come together and, and risk repent of the fact that it has allowed white supremacy to run rapidly through it. Dr. King is writing a letter to clergymen who are telling him his nonviolent acts are wrong. And that he should wait for justice. This is history. This isn't history repeating itself. This is we have never made strides towards anything differently. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within, our, within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Consciously or unconsciously, he has caught up by the uh, 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 zeitgeist and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America and the Car Caribbeans, uh, the United States Negro is moving with a sense of great urgency towards the promised land of racial justice. 
If one recognizes this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why public demonstrations are taking place. The Negro has many picked up resentments and late frustrations and he must release them. So let him march, let him make prayer pr pr uh, pilgrimages to the city hall. Let him go on freedom rides and try to understand why he must do so. If his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence that is not a threat, but a fact of history. Did you hear what he said? You guys have suppressed the nonviolent uh, protest of the Negro. And so it, it has caused an emotional buildup. And he says that when that emotional buildup gets too much, it becomes expressed through violence. And he says, this is not a guess. He said, this is history. You told us we couldn't kneel. And I'm not justifying. Dr. King is not justifying. He's simply trying to warn white America that you have to stop trying to suppress the nonviolent acts of the Negro. Let us march. Let us kneel at national anthems. Let us protest. Let us speak. Stop telling us to shut up. Because what happens is that emotion express, express that expression of built up emotion will erupt into violent acts, not condoning, but telling you what will happen. I would dare go far to say that white America must take some of the blame for the nonsense that is happening across the world because you called us thugs when we kneeled. You called us insensitive when we kneeled. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your, dis your, dis your uh, discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into creative outlets of nonviolent direct action. That's what I'm telling you. We can do this another way, y'all. We do not have to burn and loot. I understand your frustration, but that is not the way. And if you are a Christian leader uh, advocating for that, you need to turn in your leadership badge because you are not upholding the way of the Lord. You are being led by the masses instead of leading them to a much better way. And now this approach is being termed extremist. He said his nonviolent approach is being termed an extremist. But though I was initially disappointed at being character characterized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despite use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? He says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. So help me, God. And John Bynion, uh, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but rather what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the person for the uh, preservation of injustice or we be extremists for justice? In this dramatic scene on Calvary Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime, the crime of extremists. Two were extremists for immorality and thus fell below their environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and thereby rose above his environment. Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. Come on, Dr. King. I hope that while moderate, see, listen, when you read his words, the, the white people who try to use Dr. King as a way to passively shut the Negro up, to passively shut the nigga up, to passively shut the black man up, you are misusing Dr. King's words. He may have been nonviolent, but he was no passive man. I hope that the white moderate would see this need. Perhaps I was too optimistic. Perhaps I expected too much. I suppose I should have realized that few members of the oppressor race can understand the deep groans of passionate yearnings and the oppressed race, and still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. 
I am thankful, however, that some of our white brothers in the South have grasped the meaning of the social revolution and committed themselves to it. There are still too few in quantity, but there are big in quantity some, such as Ralph McGill, Lillian Smith, Harry Golden, James McBride Dabbs, and Anna Bryden and Sarah Patan Bow Bow have written about our struggle in eloquent and prophetic terms. Others have marched with us down nameless streets of the South. They have languished in filthy roach infested jails, suffering the abuse of brutality of policemen who view them as dirty nigger lovers. Unlike so many of their moderate brothers and sister, they have recognized the urgency of the moment and sensed the need for powerful action antidotes to combat the disease of segregation. Remember, he's writing to clergymen, people who confess Christ. He's not writing, writing to the world of white humanity. He's talking to the church here. Let me take note of my other major disappointment. I've been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable expectations, exceptions rather. I am not unmindful of the fact that each of us has taken some significant stands on this issue. I commend you, Reverend Starlins, for your Christian stance on this past Sunday and welcoming Negroes to your worship service on a non-segregated basis. I commend the Catholic leaders of this state for integrating Spring Hill College several years ago. But despite these notable excep exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nourished in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings, and who will remain true to it as long as the court of life shall lengthen. When I was suddenly captulated into leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery, Alabama a few years ago, I felt we would be supported by the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright opponents. <laughs> Man, sounds like today, bro. Refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. Oh my goodness, sounds like today, bro. All too many others have been made cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind security of stained glass windows. Today, white church leaders call us angry, call us, they, 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 they label us people who are trying to create division, black people too, trying to create division instead of love, right? You guys are, there are some that are opponents to the movement of, of justice by trying to silence the voice of the nigger, nigg let me just say it, by telling us we are trying to create division, that we are not acting in love. Today, this letter was written in 1961. In 2020, you guys are still doing that foolish nonsense. In spite of my shattered dreams, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause. And with deep moral concern, we serve as the channel through with which our just grievances could reach the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand, but again, I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous Southern religious leaders admonish their worshipers to comply with the desegregation decision because it is law. But I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this decree because integration is, integration is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and mount pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice. I have heard many ministers say those are social issues in which the gospel has no real concern. Come on, man, listen. People like John MacArthur, call them out, right? White, black, black preachers like Vody Bakken signing this nonsensical movement that says that social justice has no relationship with the gospel, call them out. White people like James White, call them out. Sadly signing this nonsense that social justice has nothing to do with the gospel. I'll call out people I know to this day can't remember his last name, but he know his name. Ricky Gantz. They get in my inbox talking that nonsense to me. 
Dr. King says, and I have watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a stance unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between the sacred and the secular. I have traveled the length and breathed of Alabama, Mississippi, and all the other Southern states. On sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings, I have looked at the South's beautiful churches with the lofty uh, uh, point, uh, spot spears point, pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlines of their massive religious education buildings. Over and over, I have found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Uh, where were their voices when the lips of Governor Barnett di dripped with words of inter uh, 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 position of nullification? Where were where were they when Governor Wallace gave a uh, uh, a call for defiance and hatred. Where were their voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? Yes, these questions are still in my mind in deep disappointment. I have wept over the laxity of the church, but be assured that the tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is no deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather unique position of being the son and grandson of and great grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished the scarred and scarred the body through social neglect that throughout fear of being, through the fear of being nonconformist. When I get excited, guys, I start missing words and all that stuff. My bad. There was a time when the church was very powerful <laughs> and the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas of principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the morals of society. Whenever the early Christian church entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christian for being disturbers of the peace and outsider agitators. But the Christian pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven called to obey God rather than man. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. By their efforts and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils um, and, and, and gladiatorial contests. Things are different now. So often the contemporary church is weak ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is uh, an arch defender of the status quo. Far often being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silence and often even vocal sanctions of things as they are. You know what he just said? He just said, people that are looking for a way to justify the racial prejudices look to the church that is silent as a means of justification. Well, the church isn't talking on this. My pastor isn't speaking on this, so I cannot be too wrong because my man of God doesn't find anything wrong with it as well. They, look to, they have looked to the church to be their justifiable voice. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. It is today's church. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity. And I feel like today it has lost its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of min millions and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. My God. But every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. I did not just say that. Dr. King did. In 1961, he said he meet young people every day whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. In 2020, I meet young black kid, kids every day whose disappointment with the church has turned to disgust. Perhaps I have once again been too optimistic. Is organized religion too extra, uh, inextricably bound to the status quo to save our nation and the world? Perhaps I must turn my faith to the inner spiritual church, the church within the church, as the true ecclesia and the hope of the world. But again, I am thankful to God that some noble souls from the ranks of organized religion have broken loose from the paralyzing chains of conformity and joined us as active partners in the struggle for freedom. 
They have left their secure congregations and walked the streets of Albany, Georgia with us. They have gone down the highways of the South on uh, torturous rides for freedom. Yes, they have gone to jail with us. Some have been dismissed from their churches and have lost the support of the bishops and fellow ministers, but they have acted in the faith that right defeated that right defeated is stronger than evil triumph. Come on. Um, their witness has been the spiritual salt that has preserved the true meaning of the gospel in these troubled times. They have carved a tunnel of hope through the dark mountain of disappointment. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham. Even if our motives are at present misunderstood, we will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrims left Plymouth, they were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the, ma the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more, for more than two centuries, our forebears labored in this country without wages. They made cotton kings. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet, out of the bottomless vitality, they, be, they continue to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the oppression we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of our God are embodied in our echoing demands. Before closing, I feel impelled to mention one other point in your statement that has troubled me profoundly. You warmly commend the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I doubt that you would so warmly commend the police force if you had seen the dogs sinking their teeth into our un unarmed, unviolent Negroes. I doubt you would so quickly commend the policemen if you were if you were to observe their ugly and inhumane treatment of Negroes here in the jail cell. If you had if you were to watch them push the cursed old Negro women and young Negro girls, if you had seen them slap and kick old Negro men and young boys, if you would observe them as they did on two occasions, refuse to give us food because we wanted to sing our grace together, I cannot join you in your praise of the Birmingham Police Department. Let me tell you what Dr. King said I, I doubt you would do. In 2020, we learned that you would still do it. He said, if you had seen this, he doubt you would do so. But now we see it and you still commend wicked police. It is true that the police have exercised a decree of discipline in handling the demonstrators. In this sense, they have conducted themselves rather nonviolently in public. But for what purpose? To preserve the evil system of segregation. Hear what he's about to say, y'all. Over the past few years, I have consistently preached that nonviolence demands that the means we use must be as pure as the end we seek. I have tried to make clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to obtain moral ends, but now I must affirm that it is just as wrong or, per, or perhaps even more so to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. What is he saying? Perhaps Mr. Connor and his policemen have been rather nonviolent in public, as was Chief uh, Pritch Rich, whatever, in Albany, Georgia. Uh, but they have used the moral means of nonviolence to maintain the immoral ends of racial injustice. As T.S. Eliot said, the last temptation is the greatest treason to do right deed, to do the right deed for the wrong reason. Here's what he just said, y'all. Police will be ordered to be nonviolent when the camera's on because they need to continue the perpetuated idea that the police are not, that some police are not wicked and that the justice system is not perverted and needs to be corrected. And so when the cameras are on, you let them throw bottles at you. You let them spit at you. That's only because the cameras are on. But when the cameras are off at the world of saying you're ignorant, you beat them. That's what he's saying. He's saying they have maintained peace when the cameras are on so that they can maintain the immoral injustice when the cameras are off. Mm. I wish you had commended the Negro sit-inners and demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of great pro uh, provocation. One day, the South will recognize its real heroes. There will be the James Merediths with the noble sense to pursue that enables them to face jeering and hostile mobs and with agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. 
Uh, there will be the old, oppressed, battered Negro woman symbolized in a 72-year-old woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with the sense of dignity and with her people decided not to ride segregated buses and who were uh, res and who responded with ungram ungrammatical, profound dignity to the one who inquired about her weariness. My feet is tired but my soul is at rest. There will be the young high school and college students, the young ministers of the gospel and a host of their elders courageously and non-violently sitting at a lunch counter and willing to go into jail for conscience sake. One day the South will know that when these um, disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for what is best in America's dream and for the most sacred values of our Judeo-Christian heritage, thereby bringing our nation back to those great wells of democracy, uh, which were dug deep by the founding fathers and their formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Never before have I written so long a letter. I'm afraid it is too, it is much too long to take you uh, to take your precious time. I can assure you that it would have been much shorter if I had been writing from a comfortable desk, but what else can you do when he is alone in a narrow jail cell other than write long letters, think long thoughts, and pray long prayers? If I said anything in this letter that overstates the truth and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything that understates the truth and indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. I hope this letter finds you strong in faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as um, uh, not as a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman, a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all its beauty. Yours, for the case of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King Jr. And this was his letter from a Birmingham jail. For those of you who stayed with us and those of you who came in and came off, I pray that some of you did not log off. I pray that some of you did not log off because of the uncomfortable words that were being here, that being read. But I pray that everybody heard those words. And if you have never read it, and if, cause my, I don't read the typical way people are supposed to read. I don't pause at stuff like I'm supposed to. I, I implore you to go and just pull up the PDF a, a letter from a Birmingham jail and read it and dissect it and find where you fit. Listen, not just white people. I need the white church to identify that the thing that Dr. King was writing about in 1961, you guys are still doing today. And please don't say not all of us. Dr. King, he, 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 he exalted those who were doing it, but he said that the quantity is still too few. Because it should not be some in the church who are doing it. Because if you are of the church, then the church as a whole should be doing it. The quantity will always be too few if the quantity is not all. Okay? Listen. But I also employ my black brothers and sisters. Those of you who have sided with the oppressor because you have grew up on the, on, on the, on the more gentle side of oppression. And you condemn the oppressed of us, of your own, who have grew up on the harsh sides of oppression. Stop saying your experience. You have, I have not experienced racism. So you deem that racism doesn't exist. You are wrong. You need to repent. You are an error and you are a problem. Listen, also to my black brothers and sisters who have sided with black nationalist groups that think violence is the way that we're going to accomplish anything. You are the problem. I understand that we are tired and we are fed up. I understand that it is exhausting, right? But the word of God, especially my Christian leaders who I have watched parade this nonsensical nonsense that you got to under, that, that, are, that are advocating for rioting and looting. I, I am ashamed of you. I'm ashamed of you. And on this live, I tell you, I am ashamed of you and you need to repent. And if you refuse to repent, I will no longer look at you as a leader in the church. I will look at you as a person being led that needs discipleship and needs repentance. I am ashamed of you. Yes, I understand our pain, but I will never condone it being expressed in violence and hatred. Why? Because I am a man of the word of God. And though it may not seem, and though it may not be popular, I stand in the midst, in the thick of it, as Dr. King said, between you two. 
understanding that it sucks, but never condoning that it should be done. And you too should not condone that it should be done. You are the problem, black man, black pastor, black leader who are telling the black community to go and destroy. That is not gonna solve anything. I am not saying obey unjust laws. That's not what I'm not saying, but it is not an unjust law to say don't burn down a building. We cannot say, well, white people did it and they got things accomplished, okay? But if you wanna side with the wicked, then side with the wicked and burn with them. But if you wanna stand with the righteous, then we must stand with the righteous. And the word of God tell us, do not grow weary in doing the good for in due season, you will reap a harvest. And yes, I get that we are wondering God, when will our harvest come? But I will not fall to the prayerless thoughts and actions of wickedness to try to accomplish something. I love what Dr. King said, our ends must be as pure as the means we expect. And so there must be another way. And so I'm not just calling white people to repent today. I'm calling black people to repent too who have, who have, who have grown weary in doing good and have now begun to do bad. We must be leaders and set the example. We must stand on the shoulders of Dr. King. We must stand on the shoulders of Malcolm X. Yes. We need to tell his whole story. He was not this evil man that everybody tries to make him out to be. We must stand on the shoulders of our leaders. And we must stop being led. But to the church, my heart is grieved as Dr. King's heart is grieved. With those of us who comment on, my, on Brian and Janelle's feed, with the ignorance that they say, who try to say that my passion is an expression of an unloving heart. This, these are terms that you use to silence and you must repent of it. If you dare say that social justice is not a part of the gospel, I employ you to go read the Bible. Stop reading the New Testament words and read the Bible. If you side with those people who believe that, then I need you to check your implicit bias because I don't stand with them. I don't stand with John MacArthur. I think that he has a racial implicit bias in his heart. I don't stand with the racial likings of James White. That man is just flat out racist to me. I don't care how intelligent he is. Jonathan Edwards was an intelligent theological, theological mind and he was a, a slave courting racist man that I don't believe was a Christian. I do not stand with those people. And if you wanna stand with their words then you are wrong too, black or white. I also do not stand with the, with the perversion of social justice by certain LGBTG communities because the social justice that I'm not, that I am talking about is not that social justice. We are talking about the social justice that means that all men were created equal and that all men inherently des deserve to be treated as human beings. I am talking about the justice, what Jesus says, uh, 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 um, 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 do not suppress the poor. I'm talking about the justice that Jesus says in Isaiah that when you fast and do your religious activities before me, but you oppress the, but you oppress um, uh, uh, um, people and you do not feed the poor. He says, keep your religious activities. I do not accept them. I am talking about the social justice that Jesus says that when you when you have fed the poor and clothed the the uh, and, and fed the hungry and clothed those without clothes, when you have been good to those who oppress, you have been good to me. That is the social justice that is biblical. When you say that that has no room in the gospel, you are in error and you are showing the implicit racial bias that sits in your heart and you are doing it behind the behind Christianity and you are a problem because that is no Christianity. You are doing it under the image of your white blue eyed Jesus and you are a problem for that is no Christianity. It is time that the church and the moderate white begin to stand up. My guy said last night, I'm done. My guy said last night and I appreciated it so much. He said, black people, we gotta, and we gotta stop acting like anything has ever made progress without the moderate white um, joining the movement. And I, and I checked my heart because people know me. I'm like, I'm not shucking and jiving for no white person to, to catch the movement. I'm not, I'm not, my, I, I, don't, I don't feel like I should have to attach my arms 
to white America to get anything accomplished. That was my previous thought. But as I began to look more at Dr. King's words, I began to understand, no, I need to embrace the moderate white. And I mean, I need to employ the moderate white and I need to embrace my white and brother sisters who are saying, Tanks, we are standing with you. I'm not, I, I know it sucks that you, that you have to link arms with me to get anything accomplished, but what do we want to do? Do we want to talk about what sucks or do we want to get things accomplished? And I'm in that mode now where I'm done talking about what sucks and now I'm ready to get things accomplished. So again, I'm calling my lawyers who know legislation. I'm calling our councilmen. I'm calling our rich and wealthy because somebody has to fund the acts, right? I'm calling you guys to message me because I, I, I don't know what this will become, but I'm tired of asking the question, what must me do? And it's time to start moving to do something. And let us see if God so agrees that we may be able to do something and start something that truly begins to, to move this and move us towards something that our children will be able to grow up in. Y'all see my son on my lap. I don't want my son to read the words of his father and say nothing has changed as I'm reading the words of Dr. King from 1961 and saying everything that he had hoped would happen has not happened. We are not repeating history. We have never moved forward, guys. You cannot read these words and think that we have moved forward and now we are moving backwards. No, we have not moved forward. All we have done was veil the reality that we are in the same place. And so it is 921. Dang, that took me a long time. I'm supposed to be somewhere working at nine o'clock. Listen, I appreciate you guys for reading this with me. Um, this book is called A Letter to Birmingham Jail. Um, its contributors are John Piper, edited by Matt Chandler, John Perkins, and edited by Brian Luritz. I implore you to get the whole book and read it. All right. It's a lot more to this book, but I ask you to read it. I'm rereading this book this week along with this these are my two readings this week all right this book right here is powerful i'm gonna get out of here i just want to read this one quote to you real quick um what you say man oh this is a history of christianity in africa because somebody was arguing with me yesterday, a bunch of stuff that I'm just like, you don't know what you're talking about, which is why you're, you, which is why you were arguing with me. Um, but I want to read this one quote real quick. Daddy, mommy. I think I want to read this quote. Oh yeah. Um, in 1974, Roman snod Cardinal Joseph Albert Ma, uh, Malula of Zaire said, "In the past, foreign missionaries Christianized Africa." Today, the Christians of Africa are invited to Africanize uh, Christianity. If you don't understand what that means, I implore you to do some real history and understand what white missionaries did when they went to Africa with the gospel. Your heart will be broken. I'm not going to read this in your typical history books because true history is not recorded in America uh, uh, history. They're not going to teach you this in your schools, right? I implore you to do some studies and learn what white missionaries did when they went into West Africa on the missionary journeys. I implore you to study and research slave cages and slave castles that white missionaries built. They built the church and then they built slave castles inside those churches and they still enslave black people while they would hold their typical Sunday service. I implore you to go study what a white evangelical, white supremacist Christianity did. And it is time for us to repent and take back the authentic message of Christianity. Hey, thank you guys for tuning in.